We begin our worship service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask you to look with mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and to be given over to the hands of sinners and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Yesterday was Maundy Thursday, a day on which we remembered two important things. First, that the reason we celebrate communion is to remember how Jesus died on the cross for us. The second thing is to remember Jesus' command for us to love each other just like he loves us. Today is another day on which we remember something special Jesus did. Today is called Good Friday. The reason it's called Good Friday is because Jesus, who was good, died on the cross to defeat Satan, who is bad. Now that doesn't sound very good, does it? Jesus dying on the cross? Well, it's good though, because when Jesus died on the cross, he made sure that our sins could be forgiven and everything bad we've done or everything bad that has happened to us could be cleaned away by his death. That's another reason it's good, because Jesus dying on the cross takes everything bad and makes everything better. In fact, to help us remember this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these post-it notes, remember these from yesterday, and I'm going to write down two things that I'm struggling with that I want Jesus to take care of. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this piece of paper and another thing we remember today is that when Jesus died on the cross, he was nailed to the cross. But remember again, he took everything bad, he took it on himself, and, is, and so it was nailed to the cross along with him. So I'm going to take these things I'm really struggling with. I'm going to pray to Jesus silently to ask him to take care of them. And now, as a way of giving them up to Jesus to take care of, I'm going to nail them to the cross. And now I'm going to trust that Jesus is going to take care of these things and make everything better, just like he did when he died on the cross. Everybody repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Thank you for dying on the cross for me and making everything better. Amen. The first reading is from the prophet Isaiah, the 52nd chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. 
See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted but he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Here ends the first reading. The second reading is from the letter to the Hebrews, the fourth chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way 
just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Here ends the second reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 19th chapter, beginning at the 17th verse. Carrying his own cross, Jesus went out to the place of the skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but the, that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to, bo to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished! With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear brothers and sisters, grace and peace be to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The king is dead. Long live the king. The king, by whose very word 
all creation, the sun and the sky, came into being, now hangs on a cross. The king, by whose very word, life came to all creation, and especially to human beings, hangs on a cross. The king, who is truly God, who is supreme and almighty, and also truly human, suffers a very human death hanging on a cross. The Son, which he created, is so ashamed by what it sees, its Lord, Creator, and King hanging on a cross, that it hides itself, and so darkness covers the earth for three hours. The people whom the king has created surround his cross, jeering and mocking him, saying, you are not our king. If you really are our king, why don't you do a great miracle and save yourself and then we'll believe you? The supreme king and God over heaven and earth dies at the hands of the earthly authorities, the Roman government. The king, who is supreme over all people, dies at the hands of religious authorities, claiming to usurp power for themselves. The king dies simply for telling the truth. The king dies simply for telling the truth and saying that he is the king. The king dies simply for telling the truth and saying that he is bringing in a new kingdom, the kingdom of God. And for this, he is put to death. Yet this is the very reason the king came in the first place, was to die. He did not simply come to be born, to live, to teach, or even simply to heal and perform miracles, but he came to die. And as he hangs dying on a cross, he gives royal commands. The first of these commands is to ask his father to forgive those who have put, them, who have put him to death, for they do not know what they are doing. What they are actually doing is they are helping to fulfill prophecy, prophecy which had been uttered by Isaiah, whom we heard earlier, and by many other prophets who told that God was going to send someone to take the pain, punishment, sin, sorrow, and sadness all on himself and die to cleanse it. The prophets had foretold that God was going to send a suffering servant to suffer and die to relieve the sufferings of the people whom God had created. And so this is why Jesus asks his father to forgive those who have put him to death. To not seek revenge, to not exact punishment on them, because he is already taking the punishment for their sin, for their murder, as well as the sins of all people, past, present, and future, on himself. To die as a sacrifice, to cleanse all sins by his blood, to wash away our sins 
our pasts, our guilt, to give us a fresh start to die on the cross, to give us a new chance at life. Jesus dies on the cross to forgive us. And as Isaiah says, by his wounds we are healed. We are forgiven. We are accepted. Our life has been made new. Everything is now clean. We can start over. The second royal command Jesus gives is for his favorite disciple to take care of his mother. Jesus came to restore and reestablish relationships. He came to restore the relationship between God and humanity, which had been lost because of sin. And by dying on the cross, he restored that relationship. Jesus is also about making sure that relationships between humans, between people, are restored and are harmonious. And that is why he commands his favorite disciple traditionally John, to take care of his mother. What pain Mary must have felt to see her son hanging on the cross. It is painful for any parent to lose a child. It is painful for any parent to have to watch helplessly as a child dies, and how much more so for Mary, watching her son die at the hands of his enemies, hearing only the mockings and the jeers of his enemies who taunt him as he hangs on the cross. And yet, Jesus still commands for his mother to be taken care of, to make sure that his family remains well cared for. That is why John takes her into his home, because Jesus is all about making sure that each one of us are well cared for and are provided for, and that we care for and provide for each other that just as I said yesterday, we follow Jesus' command to love each other as he loves us. Because at the cross, Jesus makes us all one family. Jesus makes us all brothers and sisters. Jesus makes us all one family in him. We are reconciled to each other our broken circles are now made to come together again. Our relationships with each other are to be restored. We are to forgive each other, just as Jesus forgave us on the cross. We are to accept each other, just as Jesus accepted us when he stretched out his arms to welcome us all in his embrace on the cross. And so, we are to become one family at the cross. The third royal command Jesus gives is to give up his life, to say it is, it is finished. The word in Greek is tetelestai, it has been accomplished, or more specifically, the price has been paid. In Jesus' time, slavery was still practiced. A slave could earn enough to buy his freedom, however, and when he was able to do so, he was privileged to wear a plaque around his neck 
that had the word tetelestai written on it, signifying that the price for his freedom had been paid. This is the same word Jesus cries out from the cross, tetelestai, the price has been paid. We are free. We are free from our pasts. We are no longer slaves to our pasts. We are no longer slaves to the mistakes we have made. We are no longer slaves to our bad decisions. We are no longer slaves to our guilt. These do not define us. These do not define who we really are. We are free from all these things. In Jesus, we are free to start afresh, to start over in life, to be free from the past, to assume a new identity, child of God, free and forgiven. We are free from everything which previously entangled us. We are free from Satan's power over us. We are free from all of these things. And we are free to follow Jesus. We are free to follow Jesus who continues to change us and transform us every day by his love, who continues to change us and transform us to make us more like him, trusting God with our lives, our struggles, and our problems. We are free to follow Jesus to let our old self die with him on the cross. As Paul says in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. And so it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We no longer live for ourselves. Our past, everything which we once followed, which we once believed to be true, no longer defines us. But instead, Jesus defines us. Life in Jesus defines who we now are. The price for our freedom has been paid by Jesus' death on the cross. We are free. As the passage from Hebrews says, which we heard a few moments ago, we have someone who understands us, who suffered just as we suffered, to whom we can always come for help. We can bring all of our problems, all of our struggles, all of our sadnesses, all of our sorrows to Jesus. He understands our struggles and our sorrows and, and our sadnesses and all these other things. And so we can bring them to Jesus and have him wipe them away, clean them away, purge them away, disinfect us from, from them all by his blood. Jesus can disinfect us from the guilt of sin, from the shame of the past, from everything else. Jesus can disinfect us from have all the bad take from having all the bad take hold of us. Jesus can wash us clean and give us a fresh start. We have someone, as Hebrews says, who can sympathize with us, who understands us, and who knows what is best for us. Jesus can wash us clean and give us a new life. 
And that, brothers and sisters, that everybody who is watching this today is the invitation Jesus extends to all of us to come to him, to be made clean, and to be given a new start in life. Is there something you want to bring to Jesus? Is there something you have been struggling with? Something that has been taking hold of you? Some, something for which you are feeling guilty? Something that has happened to you of which you are ashamed? Something that has happened to you or a decision you have made of which you are ashamed and which you are afraid is going to define your whole life? something you know you have done wrong, something that you want to confess to God, something that you want God to come and take care of and take care of for you, something that you want God to resolve and to forgive, something that you want God to help you forgive. Today, Jesus extends that invitation to you to come to him, to be made clean by his blood, and to be given a new life, a new and fresh start. Dear friends, Jesus is giving you another chance. With Jesus, there are always second chances, third chances, fourth chances, whatever. Believe, dear friends, that God loves you. He is not angry at you. He is not going to scold you. He is not going to make you feel ashamed. He is not going to condemn you. Instead, he is going to say to you, I forgive you, I accept you, and I love you. Come to me and receive a new life. Come to Jesus and receive a new life. Come to Jesus and be made clean. The king is dead. Long live the king. Come to the king and be made clean and live again. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.